All right, Ralph. I think the the cliche is that we look for reasons to talk about the NFC East because it's these big media markets. And I, I know that can be the case sometimes, but it's just not true this week in, in the week that the league year started. I mean, this is top to bottom, one of the most interesting divisions. I mean, the Philadelphia Eagles and New York Giants are two of the five biggest spenders heading into the 2024 league year. The Washington Commanders seem like they've signed the most free agents, just completely remaking their roster there with Dan Quinn in Washington now. And of course, the Dallas Cowboys doing so little that it is newsworthy in its own right. So plenty of reason to talk about the entire division. That's why we brought you on. I'm going to I'm gonna throw it to you. I host this thing, but I'm curious... Among these four teams and four very different reasons for intrigue, what jumps out to you the most about what's going on during this crazy week in the NFC East? Well, I think probably the Eagles do. They were the most intriguing team to me going in because, you know, they were two different teams last year, obviously. They were the team that was 10 and one, although, as we talked about many times, we knew they weren't playing great, but they were still good enough to be better than every team they played. And they're the team that fell apart at the end of the last season in dramatic fashion and, and a total collapse. Um, they, in in ways that, I don't know how Howie Roseman does it. He always finds cap room. He always finds ways to do it, but they got better again. Um, they get ob- arguably the most dynamic offensive weapon on the market in Saquon Barkley. Nobody thought he would pay for a running back, but, you know, he goes out and he does it. And, uh, you know, it gets the top one on the market. He adds a pass rusher in Bryce Huff to a uh, an edge rushing situation that last season wasn't great. Um, you know, there's still some unknown questions about whether he's going to trade Hassan Reddick or Josh Sweat, but assuming that at least one of them stays, uh, they're a good pass rushing team again. So, um, you know, right off the bat, they are a strong, oh, and they bring back C.J. Gardner-Johnson, a, a player not only fills a need at safety, but a lot of the defensive players on the Eagles last year thought that when they lost Gardner Johnson to free agency, they lost some of their edge and their attitude, and they could have used that down the stretch. So, um, you know, it, it's a team that was falling apart. They lose Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox in retirement, and somehow they bounce back just in a huge, huge way. And I, I've said this multiple times now. I think they're going to end up, um, by the time the season starts, I think they're going to be the Super Bowl favorites because they're looking that dangerous again. There's so many ways you can go with this. I I think for starters, I mean, shout out to Howie Roseman, general manager of the Eagles for multiple reasons, but number one, A, he's always, you know, gunning to improve this team. It's not always going to work. The trade for Kevin Byard last year, some of the moves they made last year didn't work out. Doesn't seem like it's deterred him. And then on top of that, one thing that impresses me so much, the Eagles have this flexibility in part because they were willing to, to sign Jalen Hurts the minute he showed them something. You know, the minute he has that all-pro season, they get him his extension. He's only costing them $13 million this year. And I think if you're sitting at home wondering, how the hell do the Eagles have the money to do all this stuff with so many star players already on the team? It's stuff like that that makes it possible. Yeah, you know, he's he's playing for now constantly. And, you know, all of the contracts, the big ones that he has players sign have void years where he's built in triggers that he either has to, you know, can spread out the cap room or he has to re-sign them at that point. Um, he's just a, he's a magician with the salary cap. There's always ways to create room and it is smart to lock up your top players to deals that on the front end um, have lower salary cap hits so you can build a strong team around him. So um, it allows you the luxury of a player like Saquon Barkley. You know, he's a, a, a lot of players, a lot of teams may not be able to afford him, or afford the luxury of a running back. Sometimes like a team like the Giants, they would have loved to have kept him, um, but there's only so far they're willing to go and they have so many other holes. Well, the Eagles don't have those holes and they have that flexibility. So they can go out and get those luxury weapons. They can go out and pay Gardner Johnson the money that they didn't want to pay him a year ago. And uh, it's just, and they also, by the way, they draft really well. So when they lose a player like Jason Kelsey, they've got another center that can just step right in. Um, it's to me the best front office in football. And we you know when they're able to go out and get a Barkley and a Huff, it, it shows you why it pays dividends, all the things that they've done over the years. Really quickly, you mentioned, you know, they have in house candidates to replace Kelsey. Maybe they do something at cornerback. It seems like the biggest question with the Eagles, at least before the draft, is like you said, do they move either Josh Sweat 
or Hassan Reddick, one of those edge rushers. Is is that about it? Is there anything else I'm missing? No, I think that's the big thing to to watch. Um, you know, there may be some contract extensions at some point. You know, Devonta Smith uh, is in line for a contract extension, and they've talked about that. But um, you know, they obviously need a cornerback, but there's good ones in the draft. But I think I think Reddick and Sweat are the big ones to watch. Reddick wants the new contract. Um, I think the Eagles would like to keep him, but they're fine with him. You know, they said, go seek a trade if you want. Go find out what your market value is. He'll come back to them if he does. And if it's a contract that they can handle, then, you know, they'll they'll match it. They'll 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 sign him and keep him. And if it's not, well, they'll trade him away and get the picks that they can and try to replace him in the draft. Um, Josh Sweat, I think, probably is in the same boat. I doubt he's in line for a contract extension for them. I think he, they've gotten calls about him more than they've actively uh, sought to trade him. but. It's certainly possible that they could trade one or the other. And, uh, you know, I don't think they're too worried about having to replace him in the draft or somewhere else. They always seem to find a guy. I know the Giants were big spenders thanks to the deal for Brian Burns, who they traded for. What uh, what else do you what do, what do you make of what has happened here in in North Jersey during free agency? Because, again, you you make a big splash trade for Brian Burns. All hey, it's it's looking like 07 on the Giants defensive line when you talk about Burns, Kayvon Thibodeau, as well as Dexter Lawrence. What about the rest of this Giants free agency? Because I look at it on the offensive side of the ball and I'm like, okay, what what's going on here? You signed Drew Locke. Maybe that's an insurance policy for Daniel Jones and his recovery from injury. Are the Giants still in the trade market uh to move up in the draft and and draft a quarterback? We know that the defensive line looks really nice. Where else are the Giants trending with some of the moves they've made here in the first week of the league year? Well, I think where they're probably, well, they don't have much cap room left. So uh, the Brian Burns deal took away almost all of their maneuverability. So all the signings you'll see the rest of the way, I think for them are going to be depth players. They're looking to the draft. They, They always said that they want to build through the draft over a few years, get a good base of young talent. and. I think that's the way they'll go. Um, you know, I, I do like what the Giants have done. I like that they're now spending the money in the right places. Uh, you know, they went out and got a guard that they needed. They got a swing tackle. It might end up being their starting right tackle. Um, they obviously spent the money on a premier pass rusher. We've talked about this a million times. The good teams build through the trenches. You got to protect your quarterback. You got to disrupt the opposing quarterback. That's how you win games. Um, you know, that's, so that's what they're starting to do. They, they, instead of, you know, going with their heart and spending money and cap space on a running back who, as good as Saquon Barkley is, you know, they went and signed Devin Singletary. Devin Singletary can get them 900 yards. That's all that Barkley had last year. Um, you know, especially if there's a better line in front of him. They could use him a little as a receiver. They might actually sign, you know, another back, maybe an A.J. Dillon. So they can replace Barkley without spending nearly that money. And the same with safety Xavier McKinney, who went to the Green Bay Packers. It's a, a position that they smartly, I think, feel like they don't have to invest in. And I'd rather see them invested in the line and the pass rush. So uh, they're starting to look spend in the right places, which is good. The big question, obviously, is a quarterback. Uh, you know, Drew Locke is really just a veteran backup. He's insurance in case Daniel Jones isn't healthy enough to start opening day. We don't really have any clarity on that. And, you know, would the Giants look for a quarterback in the draft they're, they're looking at them they are asking about trading up and seeing what the price is i think if they had a feasible way of getting into the top three or if one of those top three quarterbacks fell to them at six i think they'd probably jump on them i mean if you're suddenly caleb williams or drake may lands in your lap you'd be crazy to pass them up when you're not quite sure of the health of your current starting quarterback but other than that, you know, I, I don't see them taking the fourth best quarterback in the draft at pick number six when they could get a top receiver or somebody else that can help them. Um, I think they're more likely to get a, a quarterback in the second round, maybe trade it to the bottom of the first, get the next quarterback on the board, just sort of as insurance, because they do still believe in Daniel Jones. They're just not quite sure how healthy he can stay. I'm just curious to see. And I, I think that all makes a lot of sense. I think the foundation of a really fun roster is there and what they do with that number six pick is going to be very informative about where they think they're going and and how quickly they can get there. I want to pick your brain about the Washington commanders. Cause I feel like a lot of people 
it seems like are making fun of the commanders because you look at this long list of guys and I'm looking at it right now, 12 or 13 guys, and you don't see this crazy impressive signing. You don't see a lot of names that are going to get you super excited. I've seen, you know, between Austin Eckler and, and Zach Ertz, Bobby Wagner, people are joking like, yeah, this is the all pro team from 2018. But my takeaway from this is that I really like the way the commanders have judiciously spent that $100 million in cap space to where they are a better team than they were a week ago. They also haven't given out funny money that's going to bite them two or three years from now. And I think that's what I like about it. Right. It's it's smart spending. And I'm actually uh, for later this week writing for FoxSports.com about their smart spending approach to free agency, which is exactly the way you should approach it when you're a rebuilding team. And let's face it, I mean, they're starting from scratch. I think that the fact that they signed, I think it's up to 13 free agents from outside the team, and they brought in just two guys, brought back two guys who are free agents from inside the team, tells you that when Adam Peters and Dan Quinn looked at the roster, they said, we got to replace a lot of these guys. We can do better. Um, it makes no sense for this team that's basically starting over to go out and make a big splash and get a Brian Burns or a Saquon Barkley, because by the time their contracts are too rich to for them to keep, they're still not going to be good yet. It's going to be two or three years before this team is back in contention. And I think they understand that. So what they've done is they've improved almost every single player they've brought in is better than the guy they're replacing. The lone exception might be uh, they signed safety Jeremy Chin, who's replacing Cam Curl. But Cam Curl, I think the market for him is going to be crazy at safety um, early eventually. Um, so I think that um, they know that uh, they they know they knew they couldn't afford him going into it. So they didn't get a better player, but they got a more cost effective player. But they have better players at almost every other position they signed. Not great players, but guys who can help them win a little bit, help them build a program. Maybe a couple of them will end up getting a second contract down the line. Um, but it st- sort of stabilizes the franchise, improves it, and leaves them the flexibility in two or three years to spend more. They're not going to be, they don't have an albatross around their neck with anybody's contract that's weighing them down. They've still got that room, which is so important for a team that still needs a lot more. And I hate to put this expectation on them. I don't, I don't think what happened in Houston last year is going to happen every year, but we saw what it can look like when you really nail the number two overall pick. And I'm going to, I feel fine jumping to the conclusion. The commanders are going to take a quarterback. I, I don't have a problem predicting that. We'll see who it is, but whoever it is, if he is good, and like I said, I hate to compare the guy to C.J. Stroud before he even gets drafted, but that's how good it can look, even when your roster's not all the way there. So I think if I'm a Commander fan, I'm feeling good. Like, there's there's always going to be the nerves of, are we going to get this pick right? But if you do, then I really think the way they're building this thing, the sky can be the limit for them here in the next one to three years. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the expectation, C.J. Stroud has set the bar high, right, for the Texans. Um, I, you know, they had a, obviously a lot more additions. They had a lot of draft picks last year. Uh, they did a lot of things to rebuild their roster. The commanders are doing that, too. So it certainly can be done. Uh, but I, you know, if I'm a commanders fan, I don't. if you end up next year 6-11 and 11 again and something like that, 7-10, and 10, it's not completely a failure. You're really looking, and I think they're really looking, to be a more sound football team this year and maybe next year start to push towards the playoffs the year after be a real type of contender where you're a real good team again. It's, it's going to take a while. It's not always instant, but certainly if they draft the right quarterback, the potential for a quickish fix is there.